Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to do part three of my lecture series on ultrastructural descriptive techniques and pathology. In our first two lectures, we covered normal parts of the cell that you should be able to identify. Then we went over cellular degeneration, and we may see some examples of cellular degeneration in the next two lectures, which I will be happy to point out. And now we're going to start looking at some characteristics of different cell types in different organ systems. And we'll go organ system by organ system. I think we're going to start with the gastrointestinal system. And the first thing that I want to say before we dive into this is to reiterate the fact that form follows function. Okay. Cells in different parts of the body are put together in various ways that maximizes the potential for each organelle within the cell. We've mentioned a number of times, and we will see a number of times in this lecture, how, for example, mitochondria tend to concentrate at the part of the cell which has the highest requirement for energy. This has happened over millions of years. Evolution doesn't make mistakes. So you can tell a lot about a cell if you simply look at the types of organelles that they have and where they're located. Form follows function. I'll say it over and over and over again. So let's start at some cells that are fairly easily identified in the gastrointestinal tract and we'll start at the stomach. Okay, this is a drawing of a parietal cell. Remember that the parietal cell are the cells that might make hydrochloric acid. To do that, they have to take hydrogen, which they have in their cytoplasm, and they have to secrete it into this canalicular system which actually represents the outside of the cell. And then they're going to secrete it, okay, through the cell membrane here. It'll concentrate here and comes out, combines with chloride, com comes out as hydrochloric acid. But the concentration of hydrogen in this canaliculi is probably a thousand times that of the concentration of hydrogen in the cytosol. You can't have acid inside your cells. So it takes energy to pump hydrogen ions against this gradient from a place of low concentration to a place of high concentration. So as you would imagine, the mitochondria are primarily arrayed at this spot where it's pumping all the hydrogen out. Okay, so this is a, not something that we take a lot of EM of, but they're fairly characteristic. And if we look at a transmission EM, of these cells. Now, I want you to ignore this helical bacteria in there because this was from a paper that was published in late 80s in VetPath, and they ignored it too, and they didn't even mention what that was. Turned out that was pretty important a couple of years later. But if we look at this cell, you can see where the little C is here. This is a cross section through the canaliculus. This is a canaliculus here, and here's a canaliculus as well. We'll go back to the diagram, and this is what you're looking at. And if you look, the mitochondria are all stuck around these canaliculi pumping to help give energy to pump that across, pump the hydrogen across the membrane. So form follows function. The nucleus, that's sitting in the middle where it's not going to get into trouble. Okay, so that's a little bit about form follows, following function, a little bit about parietal cells. And so I'm going to show you next the other primary digestive cell in the stomach, and that's the chief cell. And that is the one that produces digestive enzymes, um, like uh, pepsinogen, which will be converted, obviously, into pepsin. Now, here's a, a bunch of great things that we can talk about with that. Remember in previous lectures, we talked about secretory cells, cells that are packaging protein for export outside of the cell. And that's what this cell does. It produces pepsin and then it, and so 
the base of this cell is all rough endoplasmic reticulum. There's a higher magnification in the inset, but it's all rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and then the apex of the cell, there's a little lumen here. The apex of the cell is taken up by these secretory granules, which are going to be extruded from the cell. Okay, so hopefully you're starting to see that form follows function. It all makes a little bit of sense. And if you were going to look at this cell, we've talked about how cells with a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum are sort of purplish. So this part of the cell would be sort of a dark purple. There are nucleus sitting here, there's nowhere else. And, and this would probably be lighter. Lots of RER, extracellular protein. Here are the secretory granules. And that's what a chief cell would look like. For completeness sake, the third major cell type in the stomach are the mucous neck cells. And those are protective. And this is sort of what you would expect from a mucus neck cell, it's got a lot of mucin granules and they're clear. There's a lot of fat in them and they're clear. And then eventually when the cell degranulates, they all come out through the top. If we could get a really close look down here, I would bet you a dollar to a donut uh, that the this is all rough endoplasmic reticulum because it's secretory lipoproteins that are going to be secreted. So those are the cells of the stomach. We don't look at them very often by EM. There's not much that we need to look at ultrastructurally, but I like it because we need to start thinking about form follows function and color. Okay, shall we go a little further down in the GI tract? I want to go into the small intestine for a minute. Okay, and the small intestine looks a lot like those prototypical epithelial cells I showed you in the first two lectures. Okay, at the apical part of the cell, we don't see a basement membrane, we don't see a nucleus down here. Chances are it's just down here and sitting on a basement membrane, but the apical part of the cell is microvilli. Okay, now I want you to look at something which will help you because there are a number of, of cell types which are commonly photographed by EM. And the microvilli will help you in certain cases, especially when you're in the intestine, because in the intestine, those microvilli are all the same size, just like somebody mowed them. They were mowing the grass and they're all at the same size. And this is unique to the small intestine because when you get into other cells with, with long microvilli, like the uh, renal tubules, they're all different sizes. They're up and down and all over the place, but you know you're in the intestine, those microvilli are all the same size. Now another clue as to where you might be in the intestine is that the longest microvilli are in the duodenum and they tend to get shorter the farther down. So when you get to the ileum, they're a lot shorter. So, you know, obviously that's something that you'd have to have multiple sections to compare, but just keep that in mind that the farther you get into the intestine, the shorter the microvilli tend to be. Okay, we can just barely see maybe part of a tight junction here. When we prepare EM specimens, you don't always get the same cut. You don't always get, for these structures to show up in anything I showed you, you really have to get a nice cut through the center of it. So if you hit a lot of stuff tangentially, whether it's a uh, a tight junction, a desmosome, a macrophage, uh, excuse me, a mi mitochondrion, you may not recognize it for what it is. We just get rid of the edge. So, you know, I don't want you to sit there and wring your hands about, oh my God, I can't find the desmosomes in these cells. You probably just didn't have the right cut. Okay, another thing that is absolutely fantastic, okay, are these penocytotic vacuoles within the uh, within the cytoplasm. Some of them are actually smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And they're all filled with this round black material. So what do you think that could be? We've talked about it before. This is a well-preserved specimen 
probably because it's so beautiful, it was preserved in glutaraldehyde or Michelle's medium, and that black is gonna be fat. And this is what happens after a fatty meal. I believe this was from a mouse, and the fat is transported within the SER until it is broken down. These are actively brought into the cell by pinocytotic vesicles, and you will see it in the cells. And then it's gonna be processed. It will be probably attached to certain proteins and will be secreted into the bloodstream at the bottom of the cell underneath the basement membrane. So a lot of things are pointing. Now this is interesting. If you look at the mitochondria, they are long, lush, vertically oriented, and they have a lot of Christi because digestion is a metabolically active process and you need a lot of energy to do all the absorption, all the conversion, all the secretion. Okay. And that's about all I have to say on that. I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. Move a little farther down to the colon. Okay. Also from a mouse and, and Look at these microvilli, they're all the same size, so we know we're in the GI tract, and we're over a Peyer's patch, and we're gonna get into all the different round cells a little farther down, but what we're looking at is a modified epithelial cell here, very stubby, short microvilli. This is an M cell. M cells are basically the covering for Peyer's patches, um, and in the Peyer's patch, you have what you would expect to have. You have a number of lymphocytes here, not the best preparation I've ever seen. The, the chromatin's a little bit uh, pale here, but lymphocytes, and we'll talk about it later, they've got a big old nucleus because they're the brains of the operation. They don't have a lot of organelles, okay? And then down here, we have a cell with a lot of secondary lysosomes. This is macrophages. This is where the antigen presentation is gonna happen and a couple more lymphocytes. But so this is what a Peyer's patch would look like when you get into the ileum, you get down into the, uh, uh, the large cecum or the large intestine of mammals. A lot of pathogens really like to enter the body here. Uh, including various forms of mycobacterium, salmonella, and other bacteria. Okay, now I want to start talking a little bit more about pink and purple. Pink and purple and how it translates to black and white. And we've, we've been hitting on this already. We talked about the rough endoplasmic reticulum, how when you have this concentration of protein, then it tends to be sort of a purplish, okay? And then you get these granules, and the granules are usually made of packaged protein, the vast majority of what we see, with the exception of uh, those that mucus, which had a lot of, of uh, carbohydrate and, and, and lipid in it, but most of, most of the granules that you will encounter are, tend to be protein. And when you get crystalline protein together, it's a bright, bright pink. Okay, it's that crystalline part of the protein. And so when we look at panic cells in the intestine, if you can see the base of it, it tends to be a dark purple, and then you have all of these reddish granules. Most proteins tend to be very dark, gray to black and if we could get closer if it's crystalline they tend to be like little shards and whether we're talking about acidophilic inclusions and in mouth mouse macrophages in the lung or antibodies they tend to be like little shards of of uh, a crystal somebody took and they broke it and when you see most things in the body tend to, as we said, go to the round because it has surface tension. Crystalline protein are always like little shorts. And whenever I see someone that looks like that, I know, hey, that's gonna be bright pink on H and E. So a lot of a lot of ribosomes, purple, a lot of uh, crystalline protein, pink, and that gives us this sort of coloration here. We're gonna see that again in just a moment. Okay, well, where are we? We're in the gut. Why the microvilli are 
all mown down. Or actually, in the large intestine of a chicken, how we ended up there, I don't know, but that's where we are. Microvilli, a lot of, uh, there's still some fat that is getting absorbed here. And I just have this in here because remember we talked about the terminal web. And for some reason, chickens have a crazy prominent terminal web in their GI tract. I don't know why. Chickens are a little, little crazy to start with with their anatomy. And I just, just saw the picture and it's like, hey, what a great illustration of that. So, you know, if you remember that, great. If you don't, probably not going to be the end of your career. Okay, you ready for pink versus purple again? We're still in the GI tract. We have cells which have a tremendous amount of rough endoplasmic reticulum. They, we have cross-section or tangential section of four of these. They're projecting into lumen, little stubby microvilli, and pretty much every epithelial cell has it. And in the apical cytoplasm, we have a lot of these granules. And if you're thinking, this will be pink, this will be purple, it's a tiny little lumen, and you said, I think this is exocrine pancreas, you are absolutely right on with this one. Notice that the, uh, the nucleus is at the base of the, of the cell. And I think it's just because the granules, you have to have a place to store the granules. They sort of push the nucleus down. That's the only reason I can think of as why it would do that. Why aren't there more mitochondria? There are some here. You know, maybe it doesn't take as much energy as it does the other parts of absorption to make zymogen granules. But uh, so think in pink and purple, form follows function. Everything, when you think about it long enough, and hopefully you don't have to think about it till you're my age, will make sense. Are you ready to throw maybe a couple of cellular degenerative changes on top of some of these? If you're getting bored with histology, let's stick with the acinus of the pancreas, the exocrine tissue. And this is from a German shepherd with exocrine pancreatic atrophy. Okay, what I want you to see is now we're starting to get, this is a cell, looks a lot like this one, but we have definitely some, the cell is bulging. It doesn't have this nice triangular appearance. So on this side, it's bulging. It's pushing everything down. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is markedly dilated. Okay, are we sure it is? Well, to me, even if that was all I had, I'd say, yeah, that this is a sick cell. But also you can see the outline of the dilated nuclear envelope. Okay, mitochondria look pretty good, but we just do not have the number of granules. They're variably sized. Look at the granules here. They're all about the same size. They're pretty regular. It's a factory. But here... They're sort of haphazardly sized. And then you get this one here. Looks, look, look, looks like a walking man or something. That's not a granule that uh, uh, you would expect to see. And some are very light. So we have a decreased number of granules. We have abnormal variation in size in a degenerate cell. So you could think of, I don't think there's anything that points you at exocrine pancreatic atrophy in this particular animal. I think that you, for something like this, you come up with a range. I'm sure there's some drugs. Certainly zinc is a toxin that affects the pancreatic tissue. If this was a bird, I might think about something like uh, uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, which likes to go after the pancreas. So I can tell there is a pancreatic insult um, well, maybe this was a dog with a gastric torsion that was hypoxic. So ultrastructure, in a lot of cases, when you see degeneration, it says, hey, there's something wrong, but you still have to come up with a good uh, number of rule outs. There are some things where you can absolutely nail it by ultrastructure, but a lot of these degenerative changes are going to be fairly stereotypical. So you're going to have to come up with your own rule out list. And then finally, we're still in the pancreas. Okay, here's another cell. 
it's bulging okay so it's pushing out it's normally there they have a pretty standard conical shape but this one is bulging so there so i i'm going to believe that this smooth endoplasmic reticulum is the dilation is correct i don't really see yeah you can just see maybe where the nuclear envelope is a little dilated here but the other thing that you see a there's two more things where are all the granules there's no granules here in this cell and they should always have granules and in the other cells around it the granules once again decreased in number decreased in the osmiophilia some are just clear and they're they're variable in size so that tells me that the factory is not working properly the other thing that i want you to uh, to see are these autophagic vacuoles okay a cell is going to do everything it can to survive it will cannibalize itself it will not only will it take parts of the membrane and the feet membrane but it will try to use organelles or whatever to stoke the fires and so in cells that are still in reversible stages of degeneration you can see large autophagic vacuoles um, of effete parts of the cell and that's what we have here and if you look here somebody put the L's in backwards no I think I might have just flip this but I think this is a good um, case of degeneration in the pancreatic acinus. This was a rat that had been treated with a, a uh, drug known as pyromycin. But I would, uh, you know, I, I would go through the same rule outs for anything else um, that you could. Maybe streptozoticin. Now that's more of an islet cell thing. Not that many toxins for acinus cells. Here's another thing, if you want to remember all epithelial cells should be on a basement membrane. Where's the basement membrane here? They've lifted off the basement membrane. That is a bad thing, and we've talked about that. When they separate from each other or they lift off the basement membrane, it's usually the one of the subsequent steps on the road to irreversible change. Ah, liver and biliary system i like liver because liver's easy okay liver are great big epithelial cells okay and it's not easy to get the well sure it, you can get a lot of you can get bunches of them if you're you know on low magnification but most of the ones that we see of the liver the pictures you don't get the whole hepatocyte you get like a piece of a nucleus. Don't say this is a large nucleus. I can't tell anything. I may be looking at 25% of it. So I'm just going to say there is a there is a cross section through the nucleus. Okay. So all the other things that we've looked at. Okay, we have rough endoplasmic reticulum. We have smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Nothing like we've seen before, where you had a lot. But uh, we have smooth endoplasmic reticulum. We have aggregates of glycogen remember that really narrows it down there really aren't many cells patocytes and skeletal muscle can store glycogen that's uh i guess diseased uh islet cells probably could but so you gotta like a lot of glycogen and these are those alpha granules or the or the aggregates of it when you start getting into the beta particles they're the exact same size as these free ribosomes and i can't tell them apart so but we have glycogen we have partial nucleus we have some rough endoplasm reticulum some smooth endoplasm reticulum now let's look at those mitochondria we do have some good mitochondria but those christy are puny they're terrible this cell's not getting any oxygen but that's sort of the norm because the, the liver's the last organ to be oxygenated and the central lobular hepatocytes which really do a lot of work um they don't get very much oxygen they are always like i say on the razor's edge of hypoxia um so classic liver mitochondria and then we have these multiple desmosomes or a tight junction right here at where the hepatocytes come together at the biocanaliculus. Okay, hepatocytes are epithelial. They're going to have these little stubby microvilli where they come together at the biocanaliculus. Why do you need so many desmosomes right there? Well, 
my friends, bile is a corrosive thing. And you do not want bile to be leaking back out of the canaliculus in between the cells because then you're going to have a raging hepatitis. Um, so the, the desmosomes, you'll always find desmosomes at the bile canaliculus. And, and nothing really looks like this if you get a good cut. Okay, this one is cut just perfectly. You can see the microvilli. It's nice and round. And let me tell you, you don't often see them cut that way. You have to be prepared to look for them um, slightly cut tangentially. If you are thinking liver, look for the bile canalicula because it is at the edge of every hepatocyte. Okay, and that's what is going to prove that you're in the liver. Should we back it up a little more? And this is where we start talking about how it's just like, EM is just like having a super duper objective because this is something that you are used to looking at under your microscope maybe every day. When you see a piece of liver, we see plates of hepatocytes or a sinusoidal architecture, or whatever you want to call it, okay? Here are the sinusoids, and in here, these little oddly shaped, very dark structures are, oh, I said that word, um, are erythrocytes. And as I will say many times, erythrocytes are your friend. Nothing else looks like an erythrocyte. They're usually real dark, depends on the preparation, but they're usually pretty dark. They have these really irregular outlines. Now you can see if you cut them right, you do get a biconcave disc. But because they're in all sorts of different orientations, you get funky looking things like this, but nothing looks like this. And so if we know that this is a capillary or sinusoid, we know that we have a sinusoidal lining. We have sinusoidal lining cells. We have the space of discs right here before we get to the next hepatocytes. And if you look sort of close, you're going to see these stubby microvilli. All these dark things you're seeing in the hepatocytes, those are, your, those are your mitochondria jumping out at you. If we go a little bit closer, here are our friends, the erythrocytes. Thank God for erythrocytes. They will save you so many times because you know, hey, I'm in a capillary. And you start working out from there. And we'll see it time and time again, erythrocytes are our friends. Here's a sinusoidal lining cell. Here are those. Here's a space of disay, And then there are the stubby microvilli, which project from the surface of the hepatocyte in the space of disay, where they're continually sampling the environment to see what's going on out there. And if you look really close, you might have to put your eye up to the, to the, your, uh, camera display or your computer display, but here is a tiny little round biocanaliculus between two hepatocytes. This may be another one here, I'm not sure. So that's hepatocytes and I love them. They're easy to tell what they are. Their mitochondria look like nobody else's. They're just couch potatoes and and that's and they're fun. What other cells do we have in the liver? Well, in the sinusoids. Okay, we have this really thin sinusoidal lining cells. And then we have these sort of triangular shaped cells with pseudopods. And it's interesting because pseudopods are great. You have some big pseudopods. You have some little pseudopods back here. And the only thing that really has pseudopods of any note are of phagocytic cells, usually macrophages and histiocytes. And, and so what we're looking at this little is this little triangular shaped cell with very few organelles is a Kupfer cell. And then if you want to look here, the where the space of dis is probably right here. Here are those stubby microvilli. And then look at these couch potato mitochondria. Now, if you ever write down couch potato mitochondria on a test, I will disavow that I have ever said that word. That's something for you to think about, but it's not something to put in a proper ultrastructural 
description. Um, macrophages and, and a lot of the other round cells really don't have much in the way of organelles because they're not meant to be long-lived cells. When you look at neutrophils, all they have are lysosomes and granules and that's about it because they only hang around for like eight hours and they're very short-lived. Macrophages are a little longer lived. The one thing I don't get are lymphocytes because they've got a big nucleus, almost no organelles, and a lot of them live for years and years. So I don't understand everything about that. We're in the liver. This is a dog. And you probably looked at the H&E here. And I want you to see how it corresponds with this electron micrograph. We have a cross section of multiple hepatocytes, including one tangential section of a biocanaliculus. There might be one right here. It's tough to tell. It wasn't cut all that well. All the organelles are sort of smushed to the periphery or smushed together because of the proliferation of all of this granular material which normally inserts itself in between organelles but when you get lots and lots of it it tends to push stuff out of the way. Fat always pushes stuff out of the way but this is glycogen and so if you get a critical amount of glycogen it starts to push the organelles apart and Hopefully now you can see why this ultrastructural photograph would translate into something which would look histologically like this. We have swollen hepatocytes, large amount of clear space, which actually represents this glycogen. These are known as spider cells. And this dog probably had either a functional uh, adrenocortical tumor or had been given some whopping doses of corticosteroids because this form of hepatocellular glycogenosis is the province of steroid hepatopathy in the dog. We're still in the liver. Only get a piece of the uh, little piece of the of the nucleus here. I've got just a crowd of couch potato mitochondria you know, I think you will get to the point where you just see one mitochondria and you say, I don't need to see the rest of the cell. That's going to be the liver. And it's probably going to be centrolobular because they're always on the razor's edge of hypoxia. You can say that. I don't mind if you circulate that. I like that. The razor's edge of hypoxia. But they're all being smushed out of the way. This is not glycogen. These are numerous profiles. They're not dilated, but they're numerous profiles of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. We've looked at this before. Hyperplasia, hypertrophy of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in the liver. This means this dog has been intoxicated for a long time. Not a short big blast of toxin because that kills them dead. That kills the hepatocyte, the dog dies or whatever. But if you give a dog a little bit of toxin every day, some of the hepatocytes are going to die, but most of them will respond and will increase the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is where they are going to detoxify whatever you give them, whether it's phenobarbital or phenytoin, common anticonvulsants, whether it's aflatoxin, why you would give a little bit of aflatoxin every day. But it just tells me that this is a body's compensatory reaction to detoxifying a daily dose of a little bit of toxin. And then right here, you could look at that and say, oh, that's the worst looking mitochondrion. But if you got real close, you'd see that it does not have a cell membrane. That is a little bit of fat. And you're always going to see a little bit of fat in sick hepatocytes because that takes energy to, it doesn't take any energy for a hepatocyte to bring fat in, but to complex it with a lipoprotein and then to excrete it, it takes energy. So sick hepatocytes will take in fat, but it can't get rid of it. Okay, just a couple, this is, I said we would have another organelle that, or two that we would mention along the way. And it's, this is not that important, but this, it was very important back in the 90s, 
a lot of literature on this when people were first starting to develop these statins to control cholesterol. And they found that in rats with large, which large amounts of cholesterol in their diet, they found these organelles, which were sort of unusual. They're not phagolysosomes. It's not uh, uh, ceroid lipofusin in, in them. Okay, as an aside, real quick, catch potato mitochondria, here's your fat, lots of smooth endoplasmic reticulum because you were giving these rats this high cholesterol and, and they develop in the presence of a high cholesterol diet a organelle called a peroxisome and these are special lysosomes for handling lipid and they always have this density within them so it's a one-off um, I haven't heard anything about them in a while but I've been giving this lecture for a long time and when I first started giving it they were real important and it turns out that only rodents really develop them it wasn't a toxic lesion it wasn't uh, didn't it was an evidence of cellular degeneration it was just that and it shows you know some of the problems that we have developing animal models for certain things so obviously so many people take statins um, and they went through the FDA and it's it's not a problem but if you give them to rodents you're going to get this particular organelle turn up in large numbers I love this picture and I love this picture and I'm gonna give you a moment or two to noodle this one through by yourself and I'm gonna tell you it is tissue from a cat Okay, and if you don't have enough time, stop the, stop the video and take a good look. So, I'm going to let you know what's going on with this. Okay, we have two hepatocytes, one here and one here. This one has a large nucleus, this one has a small nucleus. No, don't ever say that. I, I got you. You can't say that because it was just where it was cut. This one was cut near the edge. This one was cut down the middle. This one has a nucleus. This one has a nucleolus. This is not a nucleolar. This is just was cut right at the edge. Okay, so so don't ever say judge the size of a nucleus. The nucleus is central. Yes, there are numerous large mitochondria with very poor cristae. So couch potato micro, mitochondria, I'm starting to think, could I be in the liver? And then, because we know that very few cells store fat, you can see fat, especially in a cat, in the uh, renal tubular epithelium, you can see it in the liver, you can see it in adipocytes, not adipocytes, don't say adipocytes, that's not how it's pronounced, adipocytes, and that's about it are not a lot of cells that will normally will pick up fat. but So when I see it, I'm almost always in the liver and there's lots of it. There's way too much in here. Okay, are you starting to think about a disease of cats where they have too much fat? Sure, hepatic lipidosis. Okay, here's a couple of other things I want you to try to identify. Now, these are two hepatocytes. We've got other cells in here. I'm not exactly sure what they are. This cell is odd because it has a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum. I don't see the whole cell. Could it be a plasma cell? Sure. Could it be a uh, uh, could it be a, a, a fibroblast? I suppose it could be. You need a lot of that to make. And here's some collagen down here. Maybe it's a fibroblast. You know, I'm going to reserve judgment. I would simply say this is a cell with a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum. This one tough to tell. There's not much going on here. Mostly nucleus few organelles, maybe that's a Kupfer cell. You know, try not to go too far. Stop where you can justify. Other than that, you have to say, you know, not exactly sure. Need more of that cell to tell. Oh, we have all of this black material in the cytoplasm, and it's sort of granular. What do you think that is? Well, if you have an idea, good for you. I'm going to back off. You know, as we said before, don't overinterpret. This could simply be just staining artifact with too much osmium. Okay, could this be ceroid or something? I suppose it could. 
Uh, Hepatocytes in sick animals often have a lot of lipofusing granules in there, but we're a little far away, and I try not to push it. Okay, and there's one more structure that I want you to see, and it's this structure right here. Okay, if you look at it, you have some microvilli projecting into it. It's between two hepatocytes. Yes, that is a dilated biocanaliculus. And you would think bio because when we see it, it's sort of green and brown and dense, that it would be dense on EM. It doesn't work that way. This is what bio looks like. It's fairly lucent and granular. And so that's that biocanaliculus. Okay, we didn't get a perfect cut through it. Ended up looking like a sweet potato or something like that, a little off center, but that's the biocanaliculus. My diagnosis for this cat would be hepatic lipidosis. The morphologic diagnosis would be a hepatocellular lipidosis with cholestasis. And that's it. We keep it simple. Well, one more cell. And here's our couch potato mitochondria. Here is the stubby microvilli, the edge of the hepatocyte, some smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Here's our liver cell from here to here. Then we have this cell, okay? It's sort of conical, oblong if you like. It has microvilli, there's a lumen here. You have some pretty profound uh, belt desmosomes here, or tight junctions, whatever you want to call it. Here's another desmosome. Here is some filaments or some filipodia, uh, redendum membrane, whatever you want to call it, sort of hooks into each other for even better seal. This is biliary epithelium. Okay, biliary epithelium, all it has to do is sit there and not let bile leak back. That's why the, that's why these tight junctions are so big and, and, and heavy and profound. These these uh, mitochondria are sort of crazy and wimpy looking. Not much going on there. There are a few other organelles, okay? All biliary epithelium does, and this is an old concept, you know. It probably does a lot more than that. I say all it does is keep the bile from leaking into the liver. Um, it's been shown that they have, they're a lot more metabolically active than that. The only thing I don't get, and maybe it goes to the fact that they probably do a lot more than we think, is there's no junk chromatin. Everything is euchromatin. It's probably transcribing a lot of protein, doing whatever biliary epithelium does. Um, so that's what biliary epithelium looks like. And we're moving out of the hepatobiliary system to the system that everybody loves on EM. And we're going to cover the next two systems, and then we will stop this lecture. Um, Urinary and lung, I think, are some of the most commonly photographed. Um, we have a, a several pathologists work here at the JPC. They work in, in renal, but really all they do is look at glomeruli. They don't even look at the tubules. They simply focus on glomeruli, and every case that comes to them is shot by EM for EM evaluation of the glomerulus. There's a lot that goes on in the glomerulus. There are probably 50 or 60 types of glomerulonephritis when you get to the human level and the expert human level, but I'm going to break it down into two. Okay, if you want to become an expert like Dr. Cianciolo at Ohio State, that's great. You'll recognize a lot more, but let's keep it simple. And we're going to look at at the glomerulus. And we're going to look at tubules too, but really glomerulus is where it's at for EM in the kidney. And if we, we also have scanning here at the JPC. We don't use as much as we probably could. Here's a nice picture of the glomerulus. And remember that the glomerulus is composed of capillary loops. Actually, it is the organ with more blood flow, more blood vessels than any other piece of real estate in the body. It's you know, the first part is all blood vessels. So you have this knot of capillaries there. We don't see the inside, but on the outside, we see the podocytes, which have foot processes. We have the big primary foot processes, the secondary foot processes, and in between those, it's not a complete sheet. So in between those are the, is the filtration angle, which allows the ultrafiltrate to come out 
of the glomeruli to collect in the in Bowman's capsule. You know, if you want to pretend, you can pretend you're lying with your arms behind your head, looking up at the glomerulus. You're lying on Bowman's capsule, and you're looking up at the glomerulus, and this is pretty much what you would see. Podocytes and capillaries. What we don't see are the endothelial cells, which are inside the capillaries, and that's it, except for our friends, the erythrocytes. Now, when we take a section through that on transmission EM, and we're a little far back, and we're going to go closer in a minute, but this is complicated. You know, this is a complicated picture, but it's very typical. It's several capillary loops. Now, one of the things, when I see a lot of white space on an EM, I'm thinking of two places in the body. I think about the kidney and I think about the lung, and those are the last two systems we're gonna do here. So when I see all of this white space with nothing there, I'm thinking, okay, I'm probably in lung or kidney. The next thing I'm gonna do whenever I evaluate an uh, ultrastructural micrograph is I am going to find my friend, the erythrocyte. Because when I find my friend the erythrocyte, I know that here I'm inside a blood vessel. And so it becomes a little easier at this point. Blood vessels are lined by endothelium, and usually it's a very thin layer. We're going to look at it a little closer in a minute. And then if you are lucky in the picture, we got really lucky here because we have a couple of endothelial cell nuclei. Here's one here. Here's one here. It's capillary lumen, erythrocyte, endothelial cell nucleus. Sometimes to cloud the picture, you have some white blood cells adherent to the side, but this one does not. And then you have the basement membrane of the capillary. Remember that contains type 4 collagen and all that. So that's the wall of the capillary here. And that makes all of these nuclei on the outside the podocytes, those podocyte nuclei. And if you have podocytes, you're going to have primary foot processes, which are big like this and thick, and they will break into the secondary foot processes, which should, should be fairly fine and narrow. And in between each one, you should be able to see some daylight because those that's the filtration slits. Not the filtration angle. I said that before. That's an eye. These are the filtration slits. Okay, podocytes, primary primary foot process, secondary foot processes, which are right up by the basement membrane. And this is your, these are your capillary loops. On the outside of the whole thing, you're going to see Bowman's capsule, which is largely collagen, but then you have the parietal epithelium, which is on the inside, and you'll see the nuclei there. And then in between the capillary loops, we have these cells with sort of oblong nuclei with very few organelles. Those are mesangial and they have a macrophages site type of function. So we don't expect a lot of organelles. Complicated? Yes. You see a couple of them, you figure it out pretty soon. As long as you, it's a lot more complicated if we don't have our friend the erythrocyte here. But I think you'd still figure it out after a while. And this is normal. Let's get a little closer. Okay, our friend the erythrocyte is no longer here, but that's okay. I'm going to tell you it is glomerulus. I see cross sections of three capillaries. Here's one, here's two, here's three. This is the basement membrane. Okay, the basement membrane, this one doesn't look very laminar. It's more homogeneous. I think if you, you know, you imagine it, maybe you can see some trilaminar appearance, but, you know, it is the, the basement membrane. And then inside that, we have endothelial cells. Remember that endothelial cells in the kidney are discontinuous. Filtration slits are discontinuous. So the podocyte foot process is discontinuous. It's all made to push fluid out of the capillary into Bowman's capsule, where it enters the renal tubules and eventually is concentrated, becomes diluted, gets concentrated again, Various compounds are taken out of it by the renal tubular epithelium or secreted into it. Okay, but it's meant to be, glomeruli are meant to be leaky. Okay. The primary foot processes, the secondary foot processes here, there should be daylight in between them. They should not be 
you know, big and bulky and covering large amounts of room here. Okay, and here's your primary foot process here. Sorry, these are all secondary, primary, and then there's your podocyte nucleus. So here's another primary podocyte. And that is a nice, clean looking glomerulus. Okay, so when we talk about glomerulonephritis, I'm going to break it down to two types. And it's a very simple breakdown. There's many different variations of this, but I like to just simply break it down from a teaching perspective of looking at glomeruli into membranous glomerulonephritis and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. And the very simple, oversimplified, generalized description of membranous is that you have precipitation of protein into the basement membrane. You generally have antigen antibody excess in the body from some sort of chronic antigenemia, whether it's an infectious disease like heartworm disease or it's immune mediated or whatever. But you get precipitation of antigen antibody complexes. When they hit a critical amount, they start going into basement membranes all over the body. They don't zero in on the glomeruli. But remember, there's more blood vessels in your kidney than there is anywhere else in your body. So if you have that much antigen antibody complex, it's going to hit your kidneys pretty hard. And what will happen is it will deposit itself within the basement membrane. And that is membranous glomerulopathy or glomerulopathy or glomerulonephritis. I'm not a big fan of opathy words. But the, the glomerulus doesn't know it's there. The mesangial cells here are blissfully ignorant of the presence of it. It's often in a uh, on the exterior part of the basement membrane. They don't know. They don't get activated. They don't care. But it sits in there, and this protein, these protein complexes, these intramembranous deposits, they disrupt the positive negative charges within the glomerular basement membrane. It becomes very leaky, and all sorts of proteins that normally won't go through will go through. And that's membranous glomerulonephritis. And when we look at that on EM, that's exactly what you'll see. You will see that this basement membrane is probably two or three times the normal thickness because you have all of this dark deposits of antigen antibody complexes. Now, if you were just to take a bunch of kidneys and look at that, you might not pick it up. You, are, well, you will have the history that this animal has severe proteinuria. It might be high, high, uh, hypoalbuminemic, hypoproteinemic. Um, it's leaking protein. Uh, usually you don't just randomly take biopsies of glomeruli. So there's usually a history. And what you're looking at is, hey, am I going to find amyloid? Am I going to find glomerulonephritis being the two biggest causes? Um, and this is just... Is there a cause for this particular one? I don't know. It could be anything. It could be Lyme disease. It could be heartworm disease. It could be uh, uh, Shih Tzu's get it for, not Shih Tzu's, but Sharpay's get it, a lot of it for no apparent reason. Uh, it could be immune mediated against certain components of collagen in the basement membrane or whatever. But you can see these aggregates of protein within the basement membrane and it's wrecking that basement membrane and it's just allowing the protein to go out where normally it would not. Here's a picture of what actually is Lyme disease and and you can see this is we don't have a, any erythrocytes which are our friends and this dark bad looking cell is a very sick looking, and that's a terrible uh, way to describe, but it is, it is dark, it is a degenerate endothelial cell, which lines the capillary. Remember how that basement membrane is supposed to be thin and sort of homogenous. Okay, it goes from here to here, or maybe here to here, because here are podocytes. Look how thick this is is a split uh, basement membrane. And then our protein has started to aggregate. We don't have a lot of it, but here is a intramembranous aggregate of protein. But look how, how thick and 
That is a, not a very happy looking basement membrane. But the other thing that is really going to clue you in is when I see membranous glomerulopathy, or glomerulonephritis, I look for two things. I look for expansion of the basement membrane by protein deposits, and I look for fusion of the foot processes. Okay. So remember we said that we, we should be able to see daylight in between and no another secondary foot process should cover too much. Okay, and this looks pretty good here. Look at these, isn't that nice? Here's your primary foot process here, here, up and here. And these look very nice and, and, and quite happy. And then we get over here and, and they start to take up large areas. Look at this one and this one. That's what we call foot fusion of podocyte foot process and when you see the second secondary foot process fused together and covering up a lot too much a real estate then you that that is additional information which will lead you to a diagnosis of glomerulonephritis it could be membranous it could be membrane proliferative and I'll show you what that means in a little but I'm looking for damage to the basement membrane incorporation of protein and fusion of foot process. That's all I need to make that diagnosis. This is an old, old picture of a cheetah, uh, a cheetah with uh, glomerulonephritis, and and the basement membrane actually doesn't look too bad here. There's some splitting here, some plexiform change. It may be overall too thick here. A couple of of erythrocytes, which are are very close together. Um, here's an endothelial cell. You can see the fenestrations in the endothelium. All that looks nice. Okay, the thing that really jumps, starts to jump out at you is this foot process fusion. Look at this. That's a, one big secondary foot process. Okay, we're fused here. This one, these don't look too bad here, and these are looking pretty good, actually. But, but I've got a basement membrane that does is is too thick. We have some plexiform or laminar splitting here and then I have this fusion of foot processes and probably I would have a history that this animal was proteinuric, um, had some form of renal disease or whatever. I think that it's very important to have history when you're evaluating kidneys. I think that uh, you, there is a, a ch profound chance without a good history you may overinterpret changes that you see in the normal kidney. So the two go hand in hand. Um, don't look at EM, especially of the kidney, um, but I try not to look at EM blind because I find that I overinterpret things. I'm looking for the disease. And I think that you, this is, EM is something that you have to have a good correlate. It's great to correlate it with the history, it's great to correlate it with the clinical pathologic data, and it's fantastic to correlate it with what you see on a glass slide. So this is not something that you want to go into blind. Um, and I've heard it many times from uh, people working in pharma who do a fair amount of EM. They just absolutely hate when the investigator says, hey, what's the matter with this kidney? And they just hand them a couple of EM photographs. And it's not really the appropriate way on a diagnostic basis to do it. Now, if you're taking a test, of course you're going to be blinded and they're going to want you to, but you're not going to be asked to come up with very specific minimal type changes. Um, so don't blind yourself when it comes to EM. Make sure you have all of the information available. We talked about how with some people call it type 1, but with membranous uh, glomerulonephritis, the mesangium is is blissfully unaware that there's anything going on. Okay, in type 2 or a proliferative glomerulonephritis, whether you want to call it membranoproliferative proliferative or proliferative glomerulonephritis or what have you, this is where the mesangial cells have been alerted to the fact that there is protein within the basement membrane. And they're going to do a couple of things. One, they're going to reach in there and they're going to try and dig it out. Okay, now I've never met a mesangial cell who was an incredibly heavy handed and what they end up doing is just doing more damage to the basement membrane, but they're like, I want that protein. I want to get that deposit out. The other thing that they're going to do, which really makes it proliferative, is, and you get a lot of cells in there, is they're going to secrete cytokines. They get excited, they get activated, they secrete cytokines, they recruit 
a lot of other cells into the tuft that normally shouldn't be there. So these tufts are hypercellular. They tend to have more damage the basement membrane, at least ultra structurally. I wish I had better pictures, but here's a really good one. If you take just a minute and we have cross sections of multiple capillary loops, okay? And here is a basement membrane. This is the basement membrane. And you can see that the mesangial cell, these are all pseudopods. These are all pseudopods of a mesangial cell. We can't see the mesangium, but what we're seeing is those mesangial cells reaching in and splitting up that basement membrane to get these little bits of protein, these little bit round bits of protein out. They're like snacks, and they're reaching in to get the snacks. And what they're really going to do is they're going to do a lot more damage than they do good. Um, so that is that is the difference between membranous and membranoproliferative. Not every picture is going to show a great difference, but I think that it's important to be able to recognize some form of glomerulonephritis when you're presented with a uh, an EM of the glomerulus. Now let's leave the glomerulus for just a minute, and we want to look at the renal tubular epithelium, and and this will be. Uh, you know, we've talked about some of these things, and this is renal tubular epithelium. Uh, we've we talked earlier about how the uh, the mitochondria are extremely robust, and these are long. They're usually basally oriented because the biggest need for ATP in the renal tubular epithelium is at the basement, where they are they are secreting stuff back into the bloodstream. They're pushing it through the basement membrane, often against the concentration gradient. So you really get these beautiful, long, lush, basally oriented mitochondria. The other thing I want you to notice to help you tell where you are is look at the microvilli. Remember we said when you were in the GI tract, it's like somebody just mowed the lawn. But when you're in the tubular epithelium, they're, more, they're longest in the proximal. They get shorter as you go down. Um, and then when you get to collecting ducts, there's almost nothing there. But they're all different sizes. So it's a ragtag bit of, uh, of microvilli that you see in the renal tubular epithelium. You will see uh, tight junctions here. You don't want the ultrafiltrate to, to get down between the cells. You want it to have to pass through the cells so they can modify it as necessary. We don't have an erythrocyte. This is going to be a capillary here. These might be some, some white blood cells that are circulating. I think there's a serum here because you usually have multiple, you know, you have multiple tubules coming together with a vessel, the vasorecta going down through um, in between them in the interstitium. So but I think renal tubular epithelium is pretty easy to, to figure out because you here's your endothelial cell vessel basement membrane. All epithelial cells sit on a basement membrane, and you have these vertically oriented. Look at all these pinocytotic vesicles, which are bringing in material from the ultrafiltrate for processing, for sampling, for whatever, making adjustments, um, resorbing some stuff. Nice picture of these lush cristae in the bottom of the cell in the mitochondria. We have plications. We have interdigitation of the uh, of the cell membranes. Here's our endothelial cell, and here's the blood vessel that they are pushing various compounds back into. Okay, a couple of things here. This is tissue from a rat, and not every time you're going to have the absolutely beautiful cut through section of the microvilli. Sometimes it's tangential. Okay, so you have to look really carefully and you have to look at these microvilli, and they just have this loosey goosey border, but you do have the really lush uh, mitochondria. Now, if you're looking, there are these large lysosomes with a lot of lamellar bodies within them. These are abnormal. That's not right. There's even some that have been extruded from the cells, and they're in the lumen 
of the tubule. This is a condition um, which we see in rodents with certain drugs. It's known as phospholipidosis, and you get these big autophagic vacuoles with lamellar bodies. Um, so that's phospholipidosis. I, I put it in there just so you could see the odd, the you know, undulant microvilli. So not everything's going to be a perfect picture when you're looking at biocanaliculi, when you're looking at microvilli. If you're a little bit off, so you have to factor that into your thinking and identification. Um, what exactly am I looking at? I said that the microvilli got really uh, low toward the end. This is the the uh, uh, lo this is the deep part of the loop of Hanley and really has very little to do. It has no resorptive or secretory capacity. It's simply there. It's the part of the tubule that helps to set up a concentration gradient. So it just needs to be some cells there. And that's exactly what the body's given it. It's given it some cells. One or two little microvilli, very few organelles. That's the loop of Hanley. Here are three capillaries with our friends, erythrocytes. But so the microvilli, very lush at the top, the proximal convoluted, and almost nothing as we get closer to the end of the tubule. And somehow I just put in another phospholipidosis picture. I threw this one in for a couple of reasons. One, I know you get tired of normal. I even I get tired of normal. And so I want to throw in one more little pathogenic thing. And it's fun, and we mentioned this before. This is the proximal tubular epithelial cell of uh, a dog that had been uh, poisoned with lead. And you have these beautiful very characteristic lead inclusions you know that if you see that in a dog you can you can see these these would be eosinophilic intranuclear inclusions in a number of epithelial cells especially the kidney uh, in a, a dog with lead they don't usually have a little l right in the middle of them but uh, and it reminds me of iron filings there are a lot of when i was Growing up as a child, you would have a uh, you would have a game where they would give you a, a little plastic thing that had a man's face, and it had iron filings in it, and you had a magnet, and you would run the magnet underneath it to give him hair or a mustache or a beard or whatever, and it looked just like this. I'm sure very few of you ever had a chance to to uh, play with Harry Herman or whatever they called him, but it reminds me. It looked. It looked a lot like this, so I never, never missed a lead inclusion because it just reminded me of iron filings. Very dense, has this sort of filigree around the outside. But the other thing I want you to see, especially in this particular picture, is where are the microvilli. Here they are. That doesn't make any sense. That's not on the surface of anything. It's not round. They're just sort of in there in the middle of nowhere. But there they are because we got a weird tangential section okay we have a lot of secondary lysosomes here because and how do i know that instead of just saying oh that's trash well i'll tell you i'll tell you why i did um these are obviously round if i got a little closer i'd see a membrane okay they have granules like we would expect and this is a cell that's intoxicated we're expecting it to start resorbing parts of itself. Okay, if that was a normal cell, didn't have a lead inclusion, it's just a happy, healthy cell, and I looked at that, I might back off on interpreting a lot of it. But now I know this is an intoxicated cell, I might go a little farther, and these are obviously round. You have some that look like primary lysosomes, some that have granules in them. So for this thing right here, it's got a weird edge and it's got some white flecks in it. I'm not going to get pinned down on what that is. That could just be a blob of osmium. But I'm pretty okay with calling these primary and secondary lysosomes. Okay, I'm going to give you a minute in this tissue from a rat to look at this particular one. So stop the video. Take a look at it. You're, it's okay if you want to say, I've only been doing this for like an hour. How am I supposed to figure this out? But I'll, I'll let you take a look. It's all there. It all makes sense once you sort of get a grasp of it. Okay, so we are looking at tissue 
from a rat. Okay, first thing I'm going to look for is my friend the erythrocyte. There's a lot of dark black in here, a lot of round stuff. Oh, but look, here's a biconcave disc. Here's an erythrocyte. I have a capillary here. Okay, I know that's a capillary. So what's on top of the capillary? Well, I've got a rim of cells like this that's on top of my capillaries. And look, they have long microvilli. I can see the microvilli. Let's ignore all of this nonsense for a while. But I can see the microvilli. So that's the apex of the cell. So here's a cell right here. Here's one here. Here's one here. Here's another one. Here's another one. So we have five or six cells here lining the capillary. They've got long microvilli. So this is a renal tubule. I've got some over here too. So we might have the whole tubule here, but what we have in the middle is a bunch of trash. Look at all this stuff. I'm not, I, I use the term trash sort of lightly because I want you to see something here. Okay. This material is the same as this material which is in the cells. Now we've thought about what is black or what is really dark, okay? And we said fat is dark, and that's a good thought, okay? Proximal convoluted tubules in some species, like cats especially, or animals that might have diabetes or some form of endocrinopathy can take up fat. That's okay. Um, but that's there's another clue here that says that this is not fat. And... If we look in the lumen, we have the same material, but we see straight lines. And straight lines are cool because it tells me that this is crystalline protein that's been fragmented. Okay, it's been cracked. Okay, and so when you crack it, you get straight lines. Nature doesn't make straight lines, but when you get crystalline protein, you often will get these straight lines. And so I've got a lot of protein. I have protein in the lumen and I have protein within the cells. Now you have to know a little bit about rats, and, and rats, especially male rats, will develop a, uh, a protein within the cells known as alpha-2 macroglobulin. The disease is known as hyaline droplet nephropathy. You can see it in male rats of certain strains. You can also see uh, pro protein droplets in female rodents, especially mice, with the histiocytic sarcoma or something like that. But knowing that this was a rat, I'm going to go for hyaline. Here are the hyaline droplets. Here's the hyaline droplet nephropathy. I've got some lines there. So this is crystalline protein. We have crystalline protein in the lumen. This right here is a little different. It's a little lighter. This might be like a, a protein cast in the lumen or something like this. But it's those straight lines that say, tell me, think about crystalline protein. Okay, it's fun. This is great. And when you think about it, eventually it starts to make sense. It might be a little overwhelming right now. And this is really confusing. But you take what you're given. Especially, especially if you're in a testing situation, they're going to give you all the information that they can. So you take what you're given and you noodle it out. Okay, you have to work at it like a puzzle. You're not going to look at most of the M's and say, there's not that aha moment. There's a little aha moment here and a little aha moment. And you try and put it together to make a decent story. And obviously, this is something that you don't want to, to walk up and somebody hands you this and expect you to come up with alpha-2 macroglobulinemia or hyaline droplet nephropathy. But obviously, if you had a slide that goes with it and the renal epithelium has these big pink globules in it, it's going to be a much better day. And here's one that I just wanted to uh, to show you. We talk about the mucosa of the urinary bladder. I don't know if I've ever looked at urinary bladder under the microscope, but but they have something called umbrella cells. And, and in a certain species, it becomes very profound. Um, and you get sort of these little tiles on top of these cells. And what happens is when the bladder is stretched maximally. These tiles come together and they form sort of these mosaics in the apical cytoplasm. And it's like tilings, like linoleum, and it protects against, you know, urine seeping down into the mucosa to a certain extent. So that's sort of fun. It's not a big deal. Um, and then 
I think at this point what I would like to do is I want to stop. I want to start the next lecture with the respiratory system because I don't like to go much beyond 75 minutes uh, of these because there's a diminishing attention and diminishing return. So what we'll do is we'll start the next lecture with the respiratory system. Uh, it's a little complex like the urinary system, but it can be a lot of fun when you start looking at these sort of crazy EM. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye for the day. I, as always, wish you good health. I wish you happiness. I want everybody to be safe, and I will see you next time.